there's only one word that I can use to describe that first reading from the book of Numbers. Weird. <laughs> Everything about it is weird. The Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness for a long time. How long, we don't know, but it's been a good while since they left slavery in Egypt, and it's a good while yet until they reach the promised land. So maybe this is 15, 20, 25 years into their 40-year journey in the desert. The Israelites are fed up. I mean, who wouldn't be after so long a trip? They start whining like preschoolers who haven't had their naps. There's no food, they say, and we hate this disgusting food. <laughs> so which is it? Do you not have food or do you not like the food you have? And maybe they realize they're being overdramatic because when a bunch of venomous snakes slither into their camp and start biting and killing people, they think God must be punishing them for complaining. They ask Moses to ask God to take the snakes away. Moses prays for his people, and God tells him to make a snake out of bronze, put it on a pole, and set the pole in the midst of the camp. Anytime someone is bitten, they can look on the bronze snake and be healed. So a weird story. And for me, I think the, the strangest part of the story is God's behavior. Uh, because to judge from the words of the story itself, God is the one who sent the snakes uh, to kill some of the people as punishment. And that does not uh, line up with my understanding of who God is, right? If you take the, the story uh, in, of the books of the Bible as a whole, uh, we meet a God who uh, loves dearly those who God has created uh, and does not uh, wish death upon any of them. So V and I were talking about this this week, and I think we agree that uh, what this passage presents about God probably does not reflect uh, what God is like or what God actually did. Uh, so I believe that the words of the Bible are inspired by God, um, but also at the same time are influenced by the imperfections of the people who wrote them. And I think that's what's going on here. Uh, the Israelites camp in a place where there are venomous snakes, and then uh, when the snakes begin to cause mayhem, uh, as Via, you gestured toward just now, the Israelites say, well, maybe God sent those snakes uh, to punish us. And that's maybe an understandable thing to say, particularly when you've been wandering in the wilderness for many years. But that does not mean that it is true. So I think when we find uh, a weird passage like this, uh, what we can do that is good is to ask, well, what does this passage mean and... Where is the good news in this passage? I think the meaning here and the good news might be as simple as, don't make camp on top of a nest of snakes. <laughs> I think we're done with the sermon now. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, I do not camp ever, and nothing about this passage makes me want to go out and try it. <laughs> so as David said, whenever we encounter a Bible passage that is weird or difficult, we can ask these two questions. What does it mean? And where is the good news? And context can help us with both of those questions. The context of this reading from Numbers, the context of the whole Old Testament, is God's covenant with the people of ancient Israel. God promises to be Israel's God, and the people of Israel promise to be God's people. The covenant is the reason that God leads Israel out of slavery and into freedom because safety and liberation and freedom are what God does for God's people. We hear the joy of the covenant in the song that Miriam, the sister of Moses, sings right after God has led them through the Red Sea. Miriam plays her tambourine, and all the women are dancing, and Miriam is belting out, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The covenant sounds great when God has just saved you from the Egyptian army. Of course you're going to sing and dance and throw a party then. But 
what about when the honeymoon has long since worn off? And you've been in the wilderness for 15, 20, 25 years. The memories of the Egyptian army have faded, and now there's a mess of snakes loose in your camp. Years before, at the Red Sea, God had seemed close. But now God seems far away. And maybe you wonder whether the covenant, this relationship with God, is worth it. Well, I think church communities are at their best when we are honest that this happens, when we're honest that life in Christian community uh, is not always uh, singing and playing a tambourine and rejoicing but that uh, life in Christian community also encompasses those times where the covenant feels farther off. So Judy and I remembered this week uh, Pastor Nadia Boltz Weber, who is uh, a Lutheran pastor and a little bit of a celebrity in church circles. She's church famous. Church famous, <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, she used to be the pastor of a church in Denver called the House of All Sinners and Saints. And sometimes when newcomers would arrive at the church, she would say something like this to them. This community will disappoint you. It's a matter of when, not if. We will let you down or I'll say something stupid and hurt your feelings. I invite you on this side of your inevitable disappointment to decide if you'll stick around after it happens. If you choose to leave when we don't meet your expectations, you won't get to see how the grace of God can come in and fill the holes left by our community's failure. And that's just too beautiful to miss. So as a perfectionist and a churchgoer, uh, I resonate with what uh, Pastor Nadia says there um, because it reminds me of some of my experiences in church. I remember when I was growing up, it felt so liberating to realize that it was okay when I showed up at church and had a hard time paying attention to the sermon or when I showed up at church and was feeling some doubts about my faith. Uh, the, realizing that that was okay and that God was still present in those moments uh, felt very liberating to me. And I've noticed something similar since becoming a priest. Uh, it has been refreshing to realize that uh, God is still just as present in our church community when I don't make all the right hand gestures during, uh, uh, as, we, as we get ready to celebrate communion. Uh, or if I say something that's not quite correct about God. Uh, that God is still present. I can apologize if I need to, or maybe I don't, uh, but God is present in those moments. And I think that this is true whether you're talking about Christian community or other kinds of community, groups of our friends or our family, that in those moments when we have, forgive ourselves and each other and can see that God's grace uh, can be just as present. Uh, those are moments that we can help refresh uh, the covenant and see God's grace anew. So I do think it's important to say here uh, that Pastor Nadia is not talking about uh, abusive relationships or abusive communities. Uh, right when a relationship is abusive or violent, then leaving it uh, is a good and healthy thing to do. But when there is a basic level of health in a relationship or a community, then sticking with that relationship or community uh, when you encounter disappointments or frustration can reveal God's grace in a way that might not otherwise be possible. And that reminds me of a line from the late, great Leonard Cohen. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And that, for me, is where the good news is in all this weirdness. Even in these circumstances, the years of wandering and the frustration and whining and the snakes, God is faithful. Israel is still God's people, and God is still their God. 
that foundational promise of the covenant still holds, even if it looks different than it did right after the Red Sea. And because the Israelites are still in relationship with God through the covenant, they're still holding on to God, they're still receiving the grace and love of God. God's grace comes through all the celebrations and triumphs and frustrations and disappointment of a long relationship with God. And perhaps we recognize and experience that grace in fresh ways the longer the relationship goes on. The Israelites do make it to the promised land. God does fulfill God's promises to them. And maybe they can truly appreciate the awe-inspiring things God has done for them only when they can see the whole arc of their story, from slavery in Egypt all the way through to freedom in the promised land. So, yeah, I want to see if you agree. I think we've made two primary points in this sermon. I think one point is don't make camp on a nest of snakes. Or just don't camp. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you like camping, uh, then V and I like, are, are happy for you. Great. We're, we're yeah. not going to be coming with you, yeah. though. Yeah. But I think the other main point we made uh, is that God's grace is often best revealed in an imperfect relationship over time. So right in our, in our gospel today, you heard that uh, famous line, God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And we see that power of God at work, not just when we're singing with tambourines uh, by the seashore, um, but also when we are in the middle of uh, an imperfect time, an imperfect moment in our community long after uh, an, an initial joy has passed. God is always with us. Amen.